Hands up, um, anybody here who has been on a sea voyage before of any kind, whether a big boat or a small boat? Anybody? That's lots of this. Ian, the farmer, there's no? Oh, oh, see, Ian was like, no, 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 better feet in the ground. Feet in the ground. Um, I'm a bit with that. I've, I'm, I've, I've come out of fairman stock, as they say, and um, I'm not great at sea. Anybody like me? Uh, it's, it's the, the bigger the boat, it's the better it is, isn't it? The, the, bigger, the bigger the boat, um, you don't feel the motion of the ocean quite, quite the same. Um, I remember being out with um, um, John Watt, um, used, used to actually was one of the guys that led the outreach um, into Mint Law a number of years ago, former uh, religious education teacher in Fraserburgh who uh, went to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. Um, he took me out on his little Yuli. Um, one time at Fraserburgh and uh, we'd arranged it, you know, we were going to go fishing for cod or whatever we was going to fish for it. And um, he, he, uh, uh, he'd arranged the date, but as I got up that morning, I thought, it doesn't look like the best of days for going out in this boat. And as I got to the door, I said, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit rough. John is it? He says, ah, oh, it's a bit chavy kind, but we'll be all right. That was Fraserburgh speak for, oh, it's not the best of days, but I'm a fisherman, so get to it. And uh, so we got in the boat, and oh, oh my goodness me, I was greener than the cod. I'm telling you, it was, it was horrible. What a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. I don't know if you've had any dreaded experiences such as that. Um, and when, it, when, when, the, when the, the boat starts listing and going to and fro, and, it, and our stomach starts being thrown about with the boat and following it in the motion, I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm putting you off your lunch here. Um, I think surely most of us are the same. We don't cherish such an experience. We want to be on what's called an even keel. Yeah? An even keel is when the, when the boat is sitting level with the water. And in fact, the keel of the boat, we'll hear about in a, a bit more here in a second. The keel um, is, a, is a strip, if you like, that runs through the, the, the very base of the boat. And... Um, you know, a, 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 a boat that is, that is keeled, is that the right expression, George? Is, a, is that when a boat is upside down? Yeah? So when a boat is keeled, it's when a boat is upside down. It's obviously, that is an absolute disaster. An absolute disaster. But the keel, the keel of the boat is the, really the foundation of the structural integrity of the ship. Yeah? It's like the, the foundations of this building that we are standing in just now. Um, we know how important foundations are. Remember, we, we spoke about these things a lot a few months ago, and the keel is just the same. It's also a bit like the, the spinal cord, yeah? The spinal cord connected to our spine, helping us to stand upright, and all the rest of the, the nerves and the functionality of our body all connected therein. When that spinal cord is damaged, well, sadly, we've seen in, in lives the effects of that. People being... Um, relegated to a wheelchair and paralyzed, unable to walk and function in many normal day-to-day -day ways. And of course, when we speak about being in an even keel and being able to function as we should, that's God's will for us as his church, isn't it? He wants us to be on an even keel. He doesn't want us to be listed. He certainly doesn't want us to be upside down. In the family of God, God desires for us to be at peace. He wants us to be in unity. And when I think about my stomach being thrown about in a boat, my stomach churning and, churning and, and becoming sick, um, it makes me think about the opposite of us being at peace and being even keeled. And I think about disunity. That makes my stomach churn just as bad. That, that, that makes me sick. But worse still, I think it breaks the heart of our Father. Amen? Listen to what the Scripture has to say in introduction about these things. The Lord speaking in John 17 in his prayer for the church. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I in you. 
Paul, speaking to the Corinthian church, says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you, perf that you are perf perfectly united in mind and in thought. That's Corinthians 1.10. And then Paul again writing to the Philippians in chapter 2 in verse 2. Make my joy complete, he said, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. You know what he just described there? Unity. Being even keeled. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Then to the Romans in 14 and 19, he, he wrote, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Oh, I wonder, have you, have you, here's a challenge, but that's what I'm here for. As you reflect in the last week, are the things that you have done been for mutual edification? Have you been about the business of edification in the last week? Or what's been the story in your world? Even this day, even before you left this place. Um, Julia, could you sort of help the kids' church guys? Because there seems to be a little bit of confusion about where they're going. Thanks, Pam. Um, the last one, you know this well. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. God loves an even keel. He loves an even keel. Now we know, I know before you, your mind starts rewriting my message, I know that life in itself is seldom an even keel. Life brings its twists and turns and threatens to throw us upside down, but yet we walk not in the ways of this world, amen? And we walk not by the dictates of this world, we walk by faith. And by the dictates of God's word, we walk in him. It's in him that we live and move and find our being. And scripture shows us time and time again that when we are in him, we can be in the midst of circumstantial storms in this world, but yet be even killed. Hello? Such is the, 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 the nature of walking with Christ. He holds us, doesn't he? Sometimes somebody said, sometimes the father calms the storm, other times he calms the child. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. In many ways, churches are like ships. And sometimes it's very difficult as a pastor and as church leaderships, it's very difficult sometimes to get the ship <laughs> onto an even keel. Um, bit of a confession for you. I think I've been battling with this ship for a, for a long time, trying to get it on a, an even keel. And, 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 it's, and it's a bit like that sailing, I think. Sometimes just when you think, just when you think it, it's there, woof, you get thrown to the other side. You know, you're list here, you're list there. Another wave hits. Perhaps there's things that the pastor needs to learn. The leadership needs to learn. The, the, the body of Christ needs to learn. But I'm thankful that the Lord has taken us into an even keel. Again, the, the keel speaks to us of structural integrity. And um, you, you appreciate I'm just using that as a, as a theme today. But the Word of God is our keel. Amen? The Word of God is our keel. And, and when we hold to it, and Christ is the living Word, Amen? The Bible says it's by him that all things hold together. But what do you do, you know, when a, when a keel is damaged? Literally. When a boat's keel gets damaged, and, and it can happen by um, sailing over low ground, you know, where, where there's not enough depth in the water. It can get bottomed, you know, and, 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 or, or catch on rocks. And sometimes the keel of the boat can be repaired. It, it can be healed, you know. Sometimes drastic action needs to be taken where the whole boat is compromised because the keel is irreparable. And that boat needs to be decommissioned and a new one 
brought forth. I want to say to you today that there are things that have been in the culture of this ship that have hampered the voyage. Yeah? Things of disunity that have damaged the keel. And um, guys, I want to encourage you that though the keel has been damaged at times, God is healing the keel. He is restoring an even keel to this fellowship. Uh, and I've been saying it for the last number of months. Um, and, and I'm seeing it more every single week that we are experiencing greater unity in this fellowship than I think has ever been there. It, but it's like when you purify silver and when you pur purify gold. Um, there are st things that come to the surface in the unity process. There are things that come to the top. I'm not going to give the object lesson on that just now, but, you know, the, the, uh, the ironmonger or the whoever, the goldsmith, will sift away the impurities from the top, leaving the purer elements below. And I really believe that that has been the process that the Lord has not just been taking this fellowship on the last few years, not just the last two years, the old pandemic, but probably the last four years as I reflect. Um, and as Gareth was saying, it, you hear things about other fellowships, but, uh, and, and I could have told you this, but it's just me telling you, and there the guys were able to hear um, some testimonies, other fellowships, and how they've really been through the mire, and how the Lord in his own way has been purifying them, and uniting them, and helping them. Um, the, many of the things that we have been experiencing um, is no surprise, or maybe it is to you, are church-centric issues. They are issues that go back right into the time that the scriptures were written. There's nothing new under the sun. But equally, we must hold to the keel. We must bring God's word. If we're going to see the keel brought level, if we're going to see unity, true unity, not lip service unity, because I hate that stuff, but if we're going to see word of God unity in the ship that is this fellowship, um, then, then, then it means that we need to be open-hearted. We need to be willing and we need to be true. We're going to look at the book of Ezra just in the time that we have left this morning and uh, see what God did amongst his people um, in bringing an even keel and see some principles that we can find help and encouragement from this morning. Um, as you're looking up the book of Ezra, and you'll find it just before Nehemiah, um, Jewish tradition um, has long since attributed the writing of this book, the book of, ne of, of Ezra, to um, Ezra himself. There are different opinions, but Jewish tradition and many scholars would say that it was Ezra that wrote it. And I don't know if you know this also, but, but uh, Ezra and Nehemiah actually used to be one book. Now, some scholars again believe that before it was one book, it was two books. So get your head around that. So we've got the two books today. It was once one book, and it possibly was two books before that. But all that we do need to see is that there is absolutely a definite flow through the two books. Yeah, They're, they're meant to be read consecutively, and there are principles that run through both and consistency that we can learn from. Ezra himself was a direct descendant of Aaron, the, the chief priest. And so as well as being a scribe um, and, uh, you know, somebody that was an expert on the, you know, the, the Torah, the law, um, this meant that Ezra was himself a priest. And um, historically, the books are set, these two books are set 50 years um, after the Babylonians had destroyed, uh, destroyed all of Israel and the temple. And that's where we are just about to join um, on the account of what happened there. Um, Ezra then begins to detail as we start in Ezra chapter 1. We're not going to read that now. We're going to go to chapter 3. Ezra then details from chapter 1 the return of some of the Israelites into Jerusalem and then gives account of what happened once they settled in, the things that God led them to do, and how that planned 
out for them. And there were three leaders that we read through these two books that were spearheading the efforts um, that, that really stand out. Uh, three people called Zerubbabel, Ezra, and of course, Nehemiah. Zerubbabel led a large group back into Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. You read that in chapters 1 through 6. Then Ezra arrived 60 years later to teach the law and to rebuild the community. You read that in chapters 7 through 10 of the book of Ezra. And then Nehemiah, of course, famously was called by God to come and rebuild the walls. And we are going to join, as I said, in Ezra chapter 3. Are you there? It says, When the seventh month came, and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. Then in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the festival of tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices, the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as freewill offerings to the Lord. On the seventh day, the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings. Right, and then we verse, read verse 7. They gave money to stonemasons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre. And they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. In the second month of the second year, after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedak, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, and all who had returned from captivity to Jerusalem, began the work. They appointed Levites 20 years old and older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers and Carmel and his sons, descendants of Hodaviah, and the sons of Hanadad and their sons and brothers, all Levites joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. We're nearly there. When the brothers laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord, as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout. Okay, it was them, Naos. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Got a wee bit yet. Remember the even keel? Remember what it represents? Foundations and the structural integrity and strength. You're thinking, no better holding off your celebrations till the, the thing's built. You've just got the found, foundations in. <laughs> What's the big deal? This was the beginning of the whole thing. This was like the spinal cord, remember? This was like the keel on the ship. Verse 12. So everyone's rejoicing. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Fascinating, huh? Fascinating. We've got this great noise that is coming from the city and people can't, looking on, that are not involved in the commotion, are looking on and they can't distinguish 
And when they're having a conversation, there's the picture, are those people happy or are they sad? It sounds like they're rejoicing. No, it sounds like they're wailing, says another. They couldn't distinguish because there were as many people gutted as there were celebrating. Fascinating. Fascinating. As we read through, and we're going to hear again from these books next week, and as we read through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, what we see time and again is these three um, people that I mentioned, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, spearheaded efforts to do great things for God, yeah? They were looking to build the kingdom, if you like, if we can use that terminology, yeah? Looking to reestablish the temple, looking to reestablish um, godly worship, looking to reestablish the walls, looking to glorify the king. Hey, I meant to take a, an illustration with me today to let you see. Typical me, I forgot it. Um, but it's a simple one. It's, it, it's a balloon. If you can imagine I'm holding a balloon just now, and it's inflated, um, regardless of what's inside it, if it's helium or what it is, if I was to press against the side of that balloon, what you see is resistance. Yeah? Um, you wouldn't see it if the skin of the balloon wasn't there. And I was saying to somebody this week, it, it perfectly illustrates to me um, the, the dynamic of spiritual warfare, you might say, or the resistance that we encounter as Christians and as God's people when we look to carry out the will and purpose of God. Whenever we look to walk in the will of God, there will always be resistance. You see, the problem is, it's maybe good I don't have the balloon because I might have had to burst it. Sometimes we don't see the form of the resistance. We, can't, we find it hard to distinguish exactly what it's, what's going on. But whenever we look to move forward with God, you can be sure that the resistance is always there. But yet the Lord says, I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we see all through these books the opposition that these guys faced as they looked to move forward. Um, aside from demonic strategies, and sometimes they can be entwined in some of the things I'm going to mention just now, but aside in principle from demonic strategies of Satan, opposition generally comes in the following ways. Through people being stuck in the past, people having a different agenda, or people not possessing the same vision. And I'm going to take a look at these three, three things with you just now. The, the, the noise that couldn't be distinguished between these two groups um, speaks so strongly of this principle. There were, there were people that were sentimental, no doubt, in that gathering. In fact, it would seem by what we read, that was the main problem. They remembered the temple that was. Yeah, they remembered the temple that was. There was quite possibly, putting our humanity in the shoes of their humanity, do you get me? I, I imagine there was a, a great degree of sentimentality, oh, but we, you know, in, in a good way. Not, not, not that they weren't welcoming necessarily of the new, but there was possibly well something in them just remembering that which was. You know, and, and sometimes when we remember what was, it, it saddens us, doesn't it? Even if it was good things that we remember, it saddens us. They'll have remembered. They'll remember when, when, when young um, Nathaniel, uh, our Nathaniel, was brought through the priesthood. Remember when we, when we gave him over to the priests and he was trained in the way. Remember. Oh, remember um, Uncle Jehoshadak. And remember when, when he was a priest, but he's gone now. You know, they, they would have these memories. Or oh, do you remember the, the celebration and the, the feasting? And the sacrifices, the times of, of great things we enjoyed in the presence of our King, of our God. There's that sense of sentimentality. But sentimentality can lead us um, also into an unhelpful place as well, sometimes. You know, so, so there's nothing really wrong with that former. It's good to remember. It's biblical to remember. It's good to look back and take stock and give thanks but, but we must be careful when we look back. Of course, this is the classic danger, isn't it, of looking back. The danger of looking back is that we get stuck back there, even if it's just in our thinking. You know, we, we can't get our heads round about 
this new thing and going forward, because all we do is speak about here. I've, I've came across so many people, and not just in my time as a pastor, but in my time as a Christian. Oh, such and such a church. Oh, it was so good. Remember, remember the days, you know, when we were in such and such a church, and oh, it was brilliant, and oh, yeah, and the, and, and the Holy Spirit would come down, and and uh, oh, it was amazing, and this, that, and the next thing, and oh, the teaching, and the preaching, and oh, and this person, and that person, and again, amen, if that was the reality, fantastic, but we don't live there anymore, we don't live there anymore, so we can't be held and captivated by the past, we've got to look forward and embrace the future. As a fellowship here at Mintlaw, um, I, I look back with so many things likewise, um, and, and I think to myself, in fact, I was looking at some photos in the computer this morning, I think about people that have been baptized, and the barbecues, and great times of, of um, intimacy we've had together with God at the center, so many things to look back and give thanks for. I see people who are no longer with us, for different reasons, some that, that have went to glory, some that have went, been led out by God and went to, you know, do great exploits for him, and some that have went out not well. And, and in all of these respects, my heart's sad, you know what I mean? Because you miss people, don't you? We're meant to be, you know, we're, we're wired that way, yeah? The Lord has made us, we shouldn't be ashamed of our emotions whilst being careful not to be led by our emotions, of course. We, we miss people. We miss people. And uh, uh, there's, so there's things we miss. I mentioned already, I miss, I miss the connect communions. But by the grace of God, we're going to get them back going again. Now we're in this new season and, and it works. Why not? Let's do it because we miss it, don't we? Don't we? There's, there's people that were, again, used to be in the life of the church in so many ways that would have spoken in my life, spoken in yours encouraged and different, done different things. And, and I miss that. I miss that. There's things I don't miss. As, we, as we're going forward, as this, as this ship is being brought onto an even keel, we, we're, going, we're going forward into different waters. And there's things, you know, as, as you go on a voyage, you're sometimes sad as you look back and you say goodbye to them that are still on the shore or vice versa. Isn't that right? Wave your hunkies. But I have to be honest that there's even some folk that I'm not going to miss. And there's some things that I'm not going to miss. Because we're saying goodbye to Tittle Tattle. Bye-bye. We're saying goodbye to gossip. We're saying goodbye to divisiveness. We're saying goodbye, Jezebel. Bye-bye. We're waving the hanky. You see, these cruise ships... They, they go on journeys, don't they? And they, they, they often stopped at different ports, sometimes to let passengers on and sometimes to let passengers off. I wonder what your place is in this ship. Because the reality is, this is not the only ship. This is not the only ship. God's put lots of ships in the water. And we don't have, a, we've said many times, we don't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit or the will of God. We're just one of many, many wee ships. And there's many bigger ships. Amen? But you need to know, you need to know where you're called. You need to know where you're called. And you need to come, and you need to come with an even keel. You need to come alongside the keel, which is the Word of God. You need to align with Him. You need to have that amen in the Spirit. Lord, this is where I'm meant to be. And if that's where you're meant to be, then your character, your mind, your tongue, and your heart come alongside in unity. Amen? Because otherwise, you'll be threatening to try and drag that ship onto an uneven keel. And we've seen so much of that. It will always be part of church life, not just this church, church life, along with many other things. But I need to tell you again, it's a new day. There's been things that have been allowed in the culture, but not anymore. Because for one thing, not just is the will of God too important, but the people of God are too important. As long as I'm still pastor of this church, I'm not going to stand by idly and let people come and play games. Let people just come and think they can say what they want and do 
what they want, it will be challenged. You see, because this is a vessel. And like a lumpet, God's made me the captain of this ship. You might think, ah, oh, here he goes, the heretic. Jesus is a captain. Let me tell you, he owns all the ships. <laughs> he owns all the ships. Remember Moses with Jethro? Jethro, his uncle, saying, you know, you're doing too much. I need to get, you know, split this up. Get folk to take responsibility over 50s. And what, what was he doing? He was setting out captains. And, and we're not just stuck in the Old Testament. We see it littered through the new. It's part of God's order, his framework, structure, if you will, for our healthy living, for the leadership of his people, for the discipling of his people, and for the expansion of God's kingdom into new territories. We've got to have leadership. So it's language that I wouldn't be quick to speak out, to be honest with you, but by God's grace. Yeah, he's made me the captain of this ship. And like any ship, there's got to be order, isn't there? There's got to be order. And I am thrilled. Honestly, this maybe sounds really heavy today. This is, it's taken a bit to bring this message forth this week. Um, but uh, I am thrilled, seriously, at the strength of this ship right now. And you maybe find yourself standing at the other side of that statement. It's, I'm not pretending it's perfect. Um, but let me tell you, if you find yourself at the other side of that, if you, you think you're on an even keel, you are the exception to the rule. You can paint the picture another way in your mind or even with your tongue, but you're not standing in a position of reality. God is bringing this ship into an even keel. This is a new day. He's bringing us onto a new voyage. And I feel like in many ways, he, he's making the ship anew, the whole thing. I think the keel was maybe that badly damaged. And I don't say it lightly, despite the smile on my face. But praise God for his grace. Praise God that his mercies are more. Amen? That even in my imperfections, I'm easy me to stand here and look at you and preach to you. I carry the burden of the damaged keel as much as any of you should. I have my own imperfections, my own humanity and sin. But again, praise God for his mercy. Praise God for his grace. Praise God that he's bringing this ship onto an even keel. Okay, let's race on. So the second thing, sometimes uh, people can come with a, a different agenda. Well, again, um, this is where I jumped ahead in my notes. Um, you, 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 might, uh, you might have a look at me and you might think, well, I could do a better job than him. And um, you could be right. In a lot of respects, you could be right. But the reality is, um, God has called me to, to captain a ship. Um, so that's something you're going to have to come to terms with. And I think it's a challenge, as we read in the passage. It's not a play on words. It's the reality of what we see in the passage, and it's a re reality of life. The older that we get, the older that we get, the greater this tension is to manage. You know, if, if we've got abilities, and we've got experience in this, that, or the next thing, being able to hold ourselves whilst the young one's coming through. It's not just in the church, it's true, is it? You know, the, the apprentice with, the, with the, the time served money, you know, or wifey for that matter, yeah? And, and you know, that's, no, that's, near, that's near the way you should be doing it. Or, is it. or is it, hey, can I tell you another way that you could do that? Yeah? And, and sometimes the, the, the longer, I mean, I don't need to look at seniors in here today. I just need to look again at myself to see the further on I go in my walk, the more danger I am of becoming cock of the north. I've been there, I've done that, I've read that book, preached that sermon. That's how you should do this. This is how you should do that. And then not living out of a position of grace, extending grace to those that need us, not making true room for them, encouraging them and lifting them into their calling and purpose. So, so maybe we need to correct our thinking Maybe you need to correct your thinking towards me. It's not an uncommon thing. The cruise ship, as I said, stops at different ports, doesn't it? And um, we love it when, we love it when the, the folk get on the ship. 
<laughs> we're never looking for folk to get off the ship. But I have, I have said it before, by the word of God, um, I, I need to encourage you. If this is not your ship, then you do need to get off because you will not be fulfilled. You will not be fulfilled. And, and, and every ship has got its makeup, hasn't it? Um, the Bible speaks to us about this in Hebrews and elsewhere. I'm not going there for the sake of time that the Lord places in the body where he wills. And that, um, you, you know, he speaks about, um, he speaks about the, the parts of the body and how we are to work in unison. And every ship has got its crew. Every work, ship has got its, its wheelhouse. It's got the passengers and so on and, and so forth. Um, but duplication only runs so far. Again, you, you can maybe only have one captain. You can maybe have a, a vice captain or not vice captain. That's not the right word. Second mate, Walter. See, the farmer had to fall away at some point. The captain has a mate and, and he has other ones. Do you, you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes we just need to be patient. There's things that we aspire to do in the life of the church, holding away from the pastoral position. There's things that we aspire to do. There's dreams and, and, and perhaps actually giftings that we possess. And it's just about being patient sometimes, not kicking against the goads, not usurping authority, which means disrespecting people's positions and what they are doing by talking ill about them or discouraging them rather than encouraging them. And praying, being prayerful and being patient till the Lord opens up the thing for you. Again, maybe the thing for you is, is, is moving into a new ministry or even stepping off at the port and getting on to a different boat. We don't like that again. We don't like that. But we're, we have to be about the kingdom of God, not just Mint Law Community Church. So I wonder again, ask the question, where, where's your place on this ship where, maybe a, a better question to ask, ask is, where's your heart on this ship? These, uh, can you imagine? Can you imagine a ship like this that they pulled up at a port and they just let anybody and any, everybody just run onto the boat and do what they want? Oh, I'm going to have a go at the wheel. You know? <laughs> oh, I'm going to cook the suppers. I'm going to be the entertainment. Oh, you know? And sometimes it would maybe work out about okay, but... I think especially in a boat like this, you can imagine how it could very quickly go south. Isn't that right? People need to be inducted, at the very least, into certain roles. They need training. They need to find the, their place. We don't, again, force our way in. We don't disrespect the harmony of the vessel. Unity is so, so, so important. And really here at Mint Law, yeah, we want people who have the best interests of the ship at mind and heart. Some folk get on cruise ships because they need a rest or a holiday. And it's okay to rest here. And they need to feel, if I come here, oh, so what you're saying, I need to ship up or ship out. I need to stand attention, scrub the decks. No, sometimes we just need a rest. Yeah, sometimes we need to just enjoy fellowship. Um, but we do believe that God gives us all um, a role to play in the body. So in time, you know, when you feel ready, um, ask, ask the Lord, if you don't know already, where's my place on this ship? How can I, how can I serve the greater vision and, and contribute to the direction that God has taken this vessel? And that leads us on to the, the last thing, people who don't have the same vision. And I could go on and on about vision. One thing, we don't have time. Um, we, we spoke, we did a whole series on vision um, quite recently and, and again, if, you, if your heart's not there, really in having a vision for a fellowship, it's completely entwined with our heart, isn't it? If God hasn't put it in our heart, that, that peace and that amen, this is where I'm meant to be and this is where I'm meant to sail and serve, whatever you want to say, then, then you need to ask the Lord at the least for clarity. You need to ask him for clarity. Um, be not mistaken. God has, has given us a vision, yeah? And there's a lot I'd like to tell you right now. There's more we'll tell you a week on Monday. Um, and even then, there's some things that I need to hold for the moment or two. But in simple terms, God has taken us back into the waters, waters that we've sailed in the early years. God is going to build his church here at the heart of Bucket. We're going to see folks saved on a regular basis again. I really believe it. 
We're going to see baptisms become not just an event annually in the calendar again, but maybe two, three times once again in the calendar. We're going to see it. We're going to see it. But, but do you see it? Do you see your place here on the ship? Is your heart there? Maybe to help you. Because I don't want you to feel, well, if it's now, oh, I, better get, I better get off next stop. You know, a simple thing that you can do is you can come up into the wheelhouse. You can spend time alongside the captain. You can, you can find greater understanding about God's vision in the heart of where God is taking this vessel. Sometimes words and words and words. We find so often, don't we, when we pray, we don't know people until we pray. Don't you find that? You know, you don't really understand people often and get a deeper appreciation for people until you pray with them. Well, if I can pray with you, I'd love to pray with you. If I can help you in your, in your journey, um, if it is indeed that you are in toil about, you know, your place on this ship or should I even be on this ship, um, come and speak to us. Come, come and share with me. Come and pray with me, with Christ at the center. Amen? Then we find an even keel. Even if it means, again, you go on a different voyage. I don't want that. Um, but we need to find God's will, don't we? What I notice here as we close in this story um, that we've touched on today, and for the sake of time, I've not jumped about all over the place, but familiarize yourself with the story. We read in chapter 4 about the, the opposition that Ezra faced significant um, opposition. And uh, the, the sum total of it was that the, um, some, some folks came alongside that were listed as being enemies of the people of God. They came alongside and said, hey, we'd like to help you here. And uh, the, the priest said, no, not on your nelly. See you. We, 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 we can't work with you. They didn't want to work with him. And it's a peculiar thing. Anyway, they went from that position clearly offended, and then began uh, to write a letter, and they took it to the king at the time, different king, now in, in service from Cyrus, uh, and um, they brought this letter to him, and they basically put in the letter, here, these guys, see when they had a temple here before, they caused none but trouble in the land, uh, and they took away some of the king's taxes, and this, that, and next thing, they sowed all of this malicious thoughts into his mind. So the king um, basically rose to the bait, and then put out an edict saying, you must stop building this temple because I'm not wanting this disharmony in the land. Some total. Yeah? Some total. Something beautiful happens. Um, the Israelites, a time later, they begin their work again. Nothing's changed by the laws in the land, but they begin their work again, and they get to rebuilding the temple again. Now, folk become aware of this, and they were getting on great working really fast. Um, and the attention of people was raised to what they were doing. So what did they do? Of course, they went to the king and said, hey, 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 these guys, man, you told these guys to stop what they were doing. Well, you'll never believe what they're doing. They're, they're only rebuilding this thing again. And uh, so the king, of course, he put out, yeah, yeah, explain yourself. And they said, hey, listen, see, 50 years ago, or whatever the time period was, um, your predecessor, he actually brought forth an edict that this temple should be built and all that went with it, that it should be refurnished with the articles of the temple and that should, God should be worshipped, the sacrifices should be made. And he went into the archives and he got out this edict and he read it and he said, carry on, carry on. And the temple was rebuilt. The will of God was done. You see, um, and a great word from my wife this morning, Numbers 23 and verse 20. Listen, I received a command to bless. God has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. God's word will always fulfill that which it is, which it is sent forth to do. It shall never return void. I said a, a few months ago that God set a fire in my belly a great number of years ago. And then that fire started to burn here at the heart of Buchan. 
And maybe it's been dumping down a bit at times. Maybe it's been a bit restricted. Maybe this old ship has went a bit off kilter here and there, off keel, uneven in the waters, and even threatened to find itself upside down. But praise God, his word shall not return void. He is continuing to build this church. The ship's coming back onto an even keel. Hear this last thing, which is quite prophetic. Um, when I was preparing for this message and thinking about the nautical themes, um, I thought maybe it was a bit sentimental, but I was thinking, I can't let go of this jubilee thing just now, you know? And I wondered, I wonder, oh, I wonder if there's a cruise ship called Jubilee. And there she is. Could you show the next picture, please, you? And here's her in, in color. It says Jubilee Old, you and sorry. Um, it's under the songs, buddy. That's her. So that's her in color, bonnet ship, right? But you know what? They scrapped that ship about maybe four years ago. I thought, oh, that's a bit sad. Um, and I was reading down about it. I thought, Lord, Lord I wonder if there's something here ties into our journey. Um, and you know what I read? Thanks, Ewan. The new one will be in the water next year. The Carnival Jubilee. The, the same company that built the first one is building another. For whatever reasons, obviously the first one wasn't just quite what it was destined to be. But they weren't going to be stopped. And neither will our God. This is the year of Jubilee. And you know what? That'll be in the water next year. I told you it was prophetic. Of course, they're building it right now. That thing's being built right now. And he's building you right now. He's building his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. We're on this ship together. And we're going to experience some great jubilee. We're going to see God's kingdom come again. We're going to see his well done here at the heart of Buchan as it is in heaven. It's okay to say it. These are hard times. And hard times can divide even close communities, even us, exactly when we need each other the most. But this is our prayer. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude toward each other that Christ had. Let's glorify God with one mind and with one voice Let's accept each other, just as Christ accepts us, to bring praise to our God. That's what the church does, in the same room or all over town. We endure in Christ together. We praise our God together. Find someone, find a way, Let's be the church this week.